Hi, it's your pal Steamed Hams. Join me every week on the Unforgettable Luncheon as we discuss topics in the nerd world like gaming, comics, cartoons, and whatever else may cross my mind. You can find me on the socials as SteamedHams81 on Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram, and YouTube. You can also find me as the Unforgettable Luncheon on Facebook. And check out Steamed Hams Merchatorium, the link to which will be in the description of this podcast. The Unforgettable Luncheon, nerd comedy at its okayest. Have you ever played a game and thought, this would make a great movie? Well, that's not always the case. Some turn out great. Some turn out campier than a Boy Scout jamboree, and then some make you wonder what cocktail napkin the script was scribbled on. Today, we're going to go on about video game movies on the Unforgettable Luncheon. Hey, it's your old pal Steamed Hams. I hope you're ready for another unforgettable luncheon. Today we're going to discuss video game movies. The good, the bad, and the directed by Juve Bowl. Now, the good, the bad are more or less my opinion. They're movies I feel fit or did not fit with. The subject matter, how close they were, things of that nature. So, it is all kind of subjective, but we're going to go into it anyways. So, we're going to start out with Resident Evil, Welcome to Raccoon City from 2021. We're going to start with a movie that I feel was as close to the original game as possible. You had the actual game character cast, no extra additions like, uh, let's... You know, you had the mansion without a whole bunch of futuristic traps and a weird underground lab that was somehow staffed by hundreds. And my only real complaint was tossing in William Birkin and Leon Kennedy from uh, Resident Evil 2. Now, granted, Resident Evil 2 did take place the same night as the Arclay Mansion incident from the game. But, you know, some creative tweaks have to happen in movies to make the story kind of gel. Um, It did have a solid story, good gore. Not a whole lot of uh, bullshit acrobatic stunts like the other Resident Evil movies that tended to suffer from sequel-itis as they went on to like 113 entries. And they actually starred characters from the game, unlike the aforementioned previous series that had someone who never made an appearance in a game whatsoever. And I understand putting Leon Kennedy in there. He was a rookie on the Raccoon City PD. So he was someone to kind of see the story and introduce the story through. So I'm not complaining too much about that. I understand why they had to do it for story cohesion. You know, it's... You you didn't have eight Street Fighter movies with some guy who was never in any game whatsoever. Never made an appearance, not a cameo, nothing. Not like what they did with Alice for uh, the Resident Evil movies, which just got sillier and sillier as they went on. But Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City is a good, solid reboot. I enjoyed it. I say give it a watch. It's a lot of fun. It's not terribly boring, and you get some good action out of it. So definitely check it out. Next, we're going to move on to Rampage from 2018. Based on the hit 1986 arcade game about giant monsters wreaking havoc upon various cities across the country, and it stars Dwayne Johnson, instead of three mutated humans from various sources, you got three mutated animals, uh, a gorilla, a gator, and a wolf, George, Lizzie, and Ralph, mutated by the same chemical in three different areas of the world. Of course, the main fight does take place in Chicago, because why not? Not like we don't have enough problems as it is with crime, politics, the weather, and of course, it being the home of Rampage. Uh, The city gets smashed, the army gets called in, and chaos ensues. You know, it didn't stray too far from what would be the minimal story of the game. I mean, there wasn't much story to begin with. Monsters smash buildings, everybody tries to stop them, fails. Uh, And... 
Dwayne Johnson was there to give us kind of a protagonist with the antagonists being the monsters and because of reasons, because we needed evil corporate people that were involved in the monsters creation. Um, it would sucks they couldn't use scum labs from rampage world tour. That would have been hilarious. I mean, why couldn't the game start off in, or the movie start off in toxic hollow, Illinois? I mean, the game, the original game itself started in Peoria Overall, not a bad movie, great special effects, great story, a lot of good humor, callbacks to the game, stuff like that. Although my big complaint was none of the monsters smashed a, build a hole in a building to eat a giant turkey to regain health. That would have been awesome. I do recommend it. Check it out. I know it is on demand with various services or get it on DVD or Blu-ray for a lot of great extras. Now moving on to another movie based on a game from my childhood that this one I did see while I was a kid, Mortal Kombat from 1994. Now, I know they did make a, a reboot in 2020, which was very good, quite close to the source material, much like this one was. Um, it can be argued that this isn't a good movie, but honestly it is, especially when you compare it to its sequel, Mortal Kombat Annihilation. It actually featured the characters, didn't have a whole lot of extras, like one or two guys who were like the, you know, the the, the Bob Jones of, who would wrestle the big name wrestler back in the day. We had the guys who just fought the guys to lose their souls. Um, it didn't make ridiculous changes to the characters. It stayed with the canon story from the games of Liu Kang being the ultimate champion. Other than having Christopher Lambert cast as Raiden, which... Cracks me up because why, you know, basically a French-speaking white dude is playing a Chinese god of thunder. Beyond me, but it was the 90s, you can get away with it. I have no real complaints about the game. They stuck some good Easter eggs and fan service in there. We got to watch Johnny Cage nut punch Goro and be surprisingly effective at it. Why couldn't they do this in the game? Why couldn't they do this in the game, Bart? Ah, uh, that's worth at least two extra stars in my book. Um, it's a great film. They stuck, you know, the fatalities, a lot of the, a lot of the great lines like the "Get over here, come here," you know, "Your soul is mine," stuff like that. Great quotable and awesome soundtrack by the Immortals, which I own. I own the original Mortal Kombat CD. What do you do about it? And Great movie if you can find it, which not too hard. I recommend watching that. Watch Annihilation if you just are a masochist, but do check out the reboot from uh, uh, 2020 or 2021, whichever, whichever it was. Um, great film. Now we're going to move on to the bad. And we're going to start with another movie that I loved in childhood, but as an adult I realized was shit. Super Mario Brothers from 1993. What happens when you take a fun kids game, have a bunch of studio interference, and let a husband and wife directing team who mostly directed music videos direct the damn movie? You get Super Mario Brothers. Now, the Mushroom Kingdom was this bright, beautiful place, you know, that was, of course, under siege by King Koopa, who was a big dragon. He had turtles and Goombas and... Lakitu's and other things to uh, try to take over the kingdom and was battled by the Mario Brothers, Mario and Luigi Mario. I'm not kidding, that is their names. Uh, to rescue Princess Toadstool, or as they now know, Princess Peach. And it was a fun kids game. Unfortunately, it's the 90s. You get a dystopian cyberpunk city called Dino Hatton covered in fungus, and run by, of all things, Dennis Hopper. Yeah, no happy little mushroom, king, mushroom kingdom here. You get, you know, the standard 90s fair, neon spikes, it's dark because it seems the whole movie takes place at night. And what happens is Dino Hatton was a parallel universe that was split away when a meteor, the meteor that hit and, you know, killed the dinosaurs split into two different parallel universes. Dinosaurs that weren't killed were thrown into this parallel universe and somehow managed to evolve into basically humans. 
you know, uh, they have the technology to evolve and de-evolve uh, people, which could either make them smarter or could turn them into Goombas, which are like tall humanoid dinosaur looking dudes with tiny heads. They weren't the cool mushroom looking dudes that Mario's can just jump on and ba-doop, squish. You know, you didn't have no, you didn't have Koopa Troopas. Uh, the Goombas were basically the foot soldiers. And Toad became a street musician, which you wonder how he got even more annoying, uh, who gets turned into a Goomba for protesting and insulting Koopa, who runs the place like a dictator. He's more like a slimy businessman, not a dragon, anything like that. As a kid, I did love this movie. As an adult, I kind of realized it was pretty shitty. You know, uh, Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo, who played Lu Mario and Luigi, respectively, said that the experience making the movie was just so terrible because of constant rewrites, studio interference, the directors not communicating with each other, and screwing around and rewrites constantly. They just regularly got drunk making the movie. I mean, you can pinpoint parts of the movie where I guess they were shit-faced. It's a it's not a terrible, terrible movie, but it could have been done a lot better. And why they chose to make a kid's movie more adult is beyond me. If you want to, if you're just looking for a movie to make fun of, here you go. The guys from Rift Tracks actually do a good pre-Rift version of it. For those of you not in the know, Rift Tracks is the guys from Mystery Science Theater 3000 uh, who continue to make movies funny. Now we're going to move on to a movie that, once again, I loved in my childhood, watched as an adult, and realized, well, I was a dumb kid. Street Fighter from 1994. Oh, jeebus. Where to start with this? I mean, the game itself has no real story except, you know, one-on-one -on -one fighting like Mortal Kombat. This actually predated Mortal Kombat by a few years, you know. You're punching, kicking, you, you fight for your best of three rounds. You win, you move on to somebody tougher until you get to the big boss man, Bison. You win, you win the game, blah, you know, you're a great street fighter. You know, you just lather, punch, Hadouken, repeat. What we get in this one is an invasion of the, the dictatorship Shadowloo. Uh, by the AN, the Allied Nations, because even the UN doesn't want to be associated with this nonsense, led by Colonel William Guile from the United States Army, a man who in the games is basically if Hulk Hogan's real American song was a person. Side note, if that song was made today, Hulk wouldn't be singing in front of monuments like Mount Rushmore, and the Golden Gate Bridge, He'd be singing in front of American monuments like McDonald's, Walmart, and Starbucks. You know, I can just see the song going, I am a real American. I want to speak to the manager. I want a non-fat soy latte. I'm offended. I'm so offended. That's a Billboard Top 100 song right there. And, of course, who do they get to play the most American-American to ever American? Jean-Claude Van Damme from Belgium. I mean, there's a multinational force with a war going on. There's not a whole lot of one-on-one -on -one punchy, kicky fighting going on. You know, by the way, which, I mean, seriously, it's a game called Street Fighter, and instead you have an army attacking another army. I don't get it. Raul Julia, on the other hand played uh, General Bison, the main villain of the of the movie, turned in the best damn final performance of final performances. The man just wanted to be in a movie his kids could enjoy, and he was literally dying of cancer during the filming of this movie. He still brought 150% effort to this movie. Okay? He was the bright spot of professionalism and acting in this movie. Okay, unlike Van Damme, who admittedly spent $10,000 a week on cocaine and was having an affair with a co-star. Couple that with the fact that shooting was just running behind schedule, getting interfered with by Capcom because they're like, hey, we got these new characters. Shove them in there somewhere. It's like, 
well, you can only, that's why the game only had like eight characters. You know, you can't focus on more than like seven, eight people. You know, and they want to shove like 30 something people in there. What the hell? The director got to the point where shooting got so behind schedule, he would just yank a page out of the script and call it a day. Problem was, more than a few vital scenes kind of wound up missing because of that. Oops. So, of course, they had to rebuild sets in Vancouver to, uh, you know, reshoot this stuff. Because otherwise the movie would make even less sense. I mean, I enjoyed this as a kid. But watching it as an adult, I just, I, I cringe. It's not a wholly terrible movie, but it had been so much better. It would have been so much better had Capcom just held their horses and Van Damme not been such a coked up diva. It's good for a bad movie night, and there also is a Just the Jokes from Riff Tracks for this, which I've heard, and it is comedy freaking gold. Now on to the directed by Juve Boll. To give a little background, Juve Boll is a German director who rose to notoriety in the early 2000s with some very loosely adapted video game films. I'm not going to bag on the guy himself because he does seem like he has good intentions. He's made some films that are worth a look that aren't honestly too bad. You know, they're not masterpieces, but they're good films. But the video game ones, oh boy, here we go. House of the Dead in 2003. I actually saw this in the theater back in uh, 2003 in Guam when I was in the Navy. Uh, my friend and I were really excited to go see this since we're both big fans of the game. Hell, I used to play the hell out of it in Sonar Tech School. We had a cabinet in, a, in like a small arcade vending uh, room back in the barracks. So I, I ended up playing it a lot. The game itself actually centered around an investigation by two government agents, uh, Thomas Rogan and G. That's all he got was G. Uh, into strange happenings at the Curian Mansion. You know, ended up involving zombies and saving civilians. Uh, lots of shooting later. Kyrian is dead. Many, many zombies are re-dead. And the game's over. Everybody walks off in the sunset, depending on how did you get, how many people you get to walk out in the sunset with. Varies. What do we get for a movie? Zombies attack a rave on Isle de la Muerte, an island off the coast of Seattle. No, seriously. It's Seattle. Of all the places this island of death could be off the coast of, Seattle. And of course, somehow, zombies attack a rave. There somehow were survivors. I don't know how that would happen because most people at a rave are high as kites. I mean, the zombies could attack. They're going to mistake them for other ravers. Get attacked. Killed. Rise up. Lather. Rinse. Revive. And it would take a little bit before people realize, oh shit. This is a zombie attack, not a party anymore. And, of course, they hole up in a house on the island and soon discover the zombie army was led by an immortal Catholic priest who was banished from Spain in the 1500s for horrible science experiments about immortality that the Vatican was not cool with. I am not making this up. Of course, a couple of the kids survive, defeat the bad guy, and are rescued by the government, specifically Agents Thomas Rogan and G. And the neat little twist, one of the survivors is named Rudolf Kurian, the uh, villain for the games. Um, I kept watching this movie and didn't walk out in hopes that it would get better. I even tried rewatching it on DVD when I got out of the military. No change. What's worse is they made a direct to Sci-Fi Channel sequel, not directed by Bull, uh, that was made in 2006. I watched it with hopes, and it did not get any better. I mean, it actually got worse. And House of the Dead 2, the arcade game, is notorious for the very lackluster voice acting. Trust me, go on YouTube, look up House of the Dead 2 voice acting. You will be amused. Moving on. Postal. This is a game where I can say what the actual fuck. The game Postal, released in 1997, features the Postal Dude as what you might call a quote-unquote 
protagonist. After being evicted from his home, he goes on a violent, insane shooting rampage because he feels that the lo- that the Air Force, coming from the local Air Force base, was spreading a hate sickness around town that was making everybody mean. So he went on a violent shooting spree. That's it. That's the game. But, of course, there was no hate sickness. Postal Blue was just actually batshit crazy. Postal, the film, on the other hand, released in 2007, makes just slightly more sense. But only slightly. Basically, Postal Dude is laughing stock in his tiniest town of Paradise, Arizona, and decides to leave it by raising money to do so to kind of get out of town and away from his cheating wife and everybody who basically mocks him. So he teams up with his scummy Uncle Dave, played by Dave Foley, who is a doomsday cult leader, uh, in order to hijack a shipment of rare plush dolls that were going for upwards of like 4K, you know, on like eBay. And, you know, they were going to sell these, raise the money, he was going to get a cut, and vamoose. But, of course, they have to also contend, uh, as this movie is trying to be as offensive as the game, which is no short order, trust me. Uh, They have to contend with a a terrorist leader who I am not naming here. Let's just say it turns out he was hiding in Paradise, Arizona, and not in caves on the other side of the world. And his best friend happened to be good old W. If you're old enough to know who W is, there you go. Again, I'm not making this shit up. They intend to infect the dolls with bird flu, because that was the big deal back in 2007, and hand them out to school children to, of course, create panic. Okay, then. Uh, they meet at a German the- a German-themed theme park, conveniently owned by Juve Bowl in a, an honestly funny cameo, where he confesses, I hate video games, after being shot in the junk. Of course, Uncle Dave's Doomsday Prophecy involves the... <clears throat> salt of a tiny entertainer played by the late Vern Troyer by a thousand monkeys. What the fuck? And of course, it happens. Why not? Because this movie's going for the offensive world record here. And Postal Guy goes on his one man rampage against everybody, where he, of course, goes postal. Oh, he said the thing. He said the thing. The world gets blown up in nuclear war initiated by W trying to cover up the chaos from Postal Dude and him and his best pal, we know who we're talking about, go skipping off into the nuclear sunset. I needed a minute after watching this movie to find out, to figure out pretty much, what the hell I just watched. I will get back to you when I finally figured that out, you know, 16 years later. Again, I'm not bashing the man himself. You know, Juve Bull made some made some good movies. Not everything was a masterpiece. He's got good intentions. But he did set video game movies back a bit on the clock. Video game movies just didn't seem it was his forte, but he does seem like he's got directing talent. Anyways, on to this week's plug and play. I'm for those of you who don't know, plug and play is where I plug a game that I think you should play. Ah, uh, and this week we're going with Far Cry 5, a solid entry in the Far Cry series. You play a sheriff's deputy who has to battle a doomsday cult called Project Eden's Gate in Hope County, Montana. Great gameplay, solid mechanics, a little bit of tongue-in-cheek referencing to prior entries with some of the things that from prior entries they didn't like, like the tower climbing and whatnot. And... You get to have a dog as one of the uh, few animal companions you are offered throughout, which was like the big reason my wife says buy this game, because you get to have a doggy with you. We have our little puppy here, you know, so she likes dogs. He, you know, he would attack the enemies. He'd steal their guns and ammo for you. I do highly recommend it. It's a great, solid entry into the Far Cry series. Check it out. I do believe it is on Game Pass. Um, You can also get it on, of course, PS4, I believe. And it might even be available on Steam. I highly recommend it. It's a fun shooter. Check it out. And that's it for another Unforgettable Luncheon. 
I hope a good time was had by all. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch at SteamedHams81. You can find me on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Buzzsprout, and wherever fine podcasts are available. Join me next week when the topic will be something nerdy, and I may be getting challenged to a boxing match by a German director. 